Ik zou knap zijn dat mensen hier niet zitten. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. Today we are going to be recounting some of the scariest park ranger tales that we have heard over the past few months. These stories are not only strange, but are largely unexplainable. These stories freaked me out, so I figured a second round would be good. I hope you guys enjoy them. If you have a story you would like to share in a future video, whether it be a park ranger story or something completely different, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help this channel keep going. Now, without further ado, let's get into these creepy park ranger stories that'll make you think twice about joining the force. I've been a park ranger for about five years. I've worked in Delaware during that time. One of the scariest and most unnerving years of that work came in my third year as a park ranger. It was during that time we started finding animals in less than, well, less than whole states to put it kindly. I remember these events just like they happened yesterday. It was a normal October morning when I was reporting in. The morning cleanup was going well enough, but by that afternoon we were called to an area in the woods by a worried hiker. They claimed to had found something horrific while hiking. Their claims were well beyond true. I told my supervisor I'd handle it, and if I had known what I was going to encounter, I probably never would have taken over. I'll be honest, I'm a brave guy, but this sort of thing that I'm about to tell you about is not the sort of thing any human should have to come across. When I arrived on the scene, I saw a 20-something year old woman crying and just absolutely mortified. I scanned the area and quickly realized why she was acting like this. All over the off-beaten trail she'd been hiking, there were bits and pieces of some sort of animal. At first we couldn't tell what it was, as the remains were spread everywhere. I remember my shock at the smell and just the repulsive nature of the scene. I comforted the woman and reassured her we'd handle it from here. I thanked her and radioed my supervisor. I told her she needed to come down and check out the scene. I also noted that I suspected some kind of animal had mauled another. When my supervisor arrived, the shock was clear in her face. She explained what she wanted us to do and we began to clean up. I remember her walking off and making a phone call while I had some others clean the area. I could overhear the distress in her voice, but I thought nothing of it as I was pretty shaken by the sheer violence of the scene myself. The rest of the day was pretty normal, and before I knew it, it was time to head home. I slept unusually easily that night considering what I dealt with that day. In what seemed like no time at all, I awoke and it was morning already. I love my job, but I remember feeling like I hadn't slept and cursing out the sun as I got up. Let's face it. Even if you love your job, you will have mornings where you're just like, man, already it's time to go back? Anyway, I made some breakfast, got up and headed to work. I was in high spirits and hadn't thought much about yesterday's events until I arrived at work that morning. It was then I found an opened deer hanging from the entrance sign to our park. I could see its entrails laying around, the blood smeared all over the sign. My boss was already on the scene and just finishing a phone call. She gave me a somewhat sickened smile before telling me to clock in and come back out this way to help work and clean on the scene. I did just that and upon arriving again at the scene I couldn't help but ask my supervisor what she thought was going on. She explained she imagined some sort of animal was responsible just by the bodies, but she also mentioned she had never seen an animal do something this vicious before, let alone in Delaware. I remember cleaning and thinking to myself, is this going to be a remainder of my career? Should I start a business in animal cleanup? As though she could read my mind, my boss approached and put a hand on my shoulder before in somewhat morbid way, laughing and telling me, relax, we might just have a new career if we keep finding these scenes. I think she saw my shock when she just smiled and said, stop worrying, it was just a joke. I let out a half-hearted laugh and went back to work. The rest of that day and week, 
nothing weird or violent seemed to be happening. I remember clocking out on Friday and mostly having forgotten the earlier events of the week. My boss mentioned that they were thinking of having a night patrol of sorts if things kept up. She wanted to know if I would volunteer if they did. She even offered to pay me for nights and would allow me to switch shifts. I told her if that's what she needed from me, I'd need a couple of nights to switch up my sleeping schedule, but I'd be more than happy to help out in any way I could. She told me that she'd be able to do that if the need came and told me to enjoy my weekend. I was off and the next weekend went well. Monday morning though, that all changed. I was due to come in that morning, and looking back now, I wish I wasn't. We have a weekend shift for newer rangers, and upon arriving Monday morning, it was quickly evident something was wrong. I found our main station wrecked. Most of the windows were busted. There was blood all over the building, and a disgusting trail, wound of red, seemed to lead from the broken down station door. Inside, I found one of our rangers. She, well, she was no longer with us. I called the cops and explained the fact that I just entered the station when I found the scene at hand, unfortunately. The main station area is a little bit out of the way. It's far enough tourists and hikers aren't likely to run upon it unless they seek it out, but close enough we can respond to any emergencies or park needs. Sadly, it seems Rosalina, one of the weekend rangers, was due to close at some point while closing, she was ambushed. The scene was something straight out of a horror movie. Sadly, it was all too real. Her stomach was completely torn open, and one of her legs as well, as some internal organs were found in the back of the station. It seemed whatever attacked her had eaten through her stomach, and then just violently ripped her remains to pieces. It looked calculated. Rosalina was alive as this thing tore into her. She was screaming, but we don't get a lot of visitors on Sundays, and I'm guessing by closing, there wasn't anyone around that would hear or be able to help her. I remember my shock and anguish over the scene and everything that had happened. We were all at a loss, and it was quickly determined from this point forward, regardless of our shift, we'd be working in pairs from this point forward. The next couple of weeks were tense. There was a dark air about the park, and the police did all they could to work the case. It was determined ultimately that Rosalina had been mauled by some sort of animal, but what animal it might be was mostly up to speculation. I began working night shifts soon after this, and was paired with my boss. The nights were long at first, they were also unusually quiet. My boss and I kept together, and when we weren't together, we kept in radio contact if one of us patrolled while the other manned the station. It was around the 1st of November when I came upon a very odd sight. It appeared to be a shrine of sorts. There were dead animals and strange symbols, but what disturbed me the most wasn't the ritualistic staging of the area, but the picture I found. Painted in some of the animal blood, it showed a beast that looked like it could have been a wolf. The thing was huge, though, and as I gazed at the picture, I remember the unnerved feelings I felt. It was as though the eyes were upon me as I stared at the picture. There was nothing else about it, just this disturbing feeling of being watched. I remember I was about to radio my boss when I heard her voice behind me. I nearly jumped out of my skin because I was so focused on the scene and that picture that I didn't hear her approaching me. She asked what had happened after apologizing for scaring me. I explained to her I found this weird shrine and that's about all I knew. I remember her watching the area closely before saying we should look for who may have set this up. She volunteered to look if I would volunteer to start the cleanup. I asked her if it was such a good idea as I believed we shouldn't search alone. She nodded and told me to keep close to my radio and we'd split up. I agreed to this but asked that we didn't stray too far away in case that one of us needed backup. She agreed and we went our separate ways. About an hour later I hear the most disturbing and pained screaming I've ever heard in my lifetime. I remember radioing my boss only to hear more screams and some sort of growling. I rushed over to where the screens were, which took me roughly 10 minutes. Once I arrived, I remember being overwhelmed by the horrid smell. My boss sat there, catatonic, as before her was the body of what looked to be a homeless man. The man's body parts were everywhere. This was the worst scene we'd happened upon yet. 
I came over to my boss and tried to bring her back. I remember she was shaking and her eyes were wide open with terror. She had tears streaming down her face and she was shaking. I tried talking to her, but she didn't seem capable of speaking and she was in complete shock. I called the police and they came out. After questioning me and my boss, the paramedics checked my boss out and took her away. The scene itself was beyond disturbing. I never knew a person had so much blood inside them until I saw the homeless man's blood everywhere. My boss called me a little later and explained she'd been out for a couple of weeks and she needed to relax and get some rest. About a week later, while I was watching the park with Harold, one of our newer recruits, we heard a loud howling and animal screams. I didn't want to take a chance and split up this time, so I asked Harold to stick with me and we'd investigate the scene together. We did just that and eventually, we happened upon a stray cat that was laying on its side, bleeding out. I remember immediately being worried about this cat, but then being overtaken by this overwhelming sense of dread. It was kind of like when you do something and realize you've made a horrible, horrible mistake, but it's too late to correct it. No sooner had the thought crossed my mind did I hear a loud roar, and in the blink of an eye, Harold was tackled to the ground and screaming. It all happened so fast. Harold was being mauled and it took me a second to process it all. When I did, I remember running up and trying to punch this behemoth of a monster in the side. It paid me no mind as it buried its teeth into Harold's stomach and began tearing him open. I fell back in shock. I didn't believe what I was seeing and I felt I was beginning to spiral into a state of denial. I remember the mace I had on me and ran up and sprayed this thing in the eyes. It quickly backhanded me and I hit a tree. I remember my head smacking with a hard thud and things were a bit blurry after that. The next thing I remember, I'm awakened in the hospital. I shot up, freaked out only to realize where I was. A nurse rushed in and called for the doctors telling them I was awake. I was asked a series of questions and told I had a light concussion and I had some bad bruising, but otherwise, I would be fine. It was then I remembered Harold and I began frantically saying his name as it was the only thing I could get out. They told me not to worry about him and to explain what I remembered about the situation. Some officers came in and we talked for a bit about what I remembered and soon after that they left. They weren't sure what to make of my description of this black fur giant wolf, but they didn't mock me either. I spent a few more days in the hospital while they monitored me. It was during that time I eventually found out that Harold had passed away. They didn't go into many details about that, but I could imagine it wasn't a pretty scene. I sat for much of my time in the hospital feeling depressed and blaming myself for Harold's death. It wasn't until my last day where my boss visited that I finally got my head in a halfway normal pace again. My boss told me she was sorry about what happened and that we were going to end the night shift for the other ranger's safety. We still work in pairs while out there in the day though. I was given a couple weeks off in addition to time off during the holidays. When I finally returned in January everything was quiet. The holidays had gone mostly news free. The park had returned to some semblance of normalcy. The month of January proved to be rather tame and I had finally gotten back into the groove of the daily routine of the job. It wasn't until the first week of February that things came to a head. I volunteered to close up while my boss left early and handled some errands she had. All assigned rangers that day had gone home. I had gone ahead and sent Mark, the ranger that was supposed to close with me, home. He wanted to stay, but I foolishly told him things had been quiet and it'd be fine. I told him to go home to his wife and enjoy his weekend. Anyway. I was doing my final rounds and it was getting close to dark when I heard a scream. The scream had sent panicked thoughts racing through my mind and my adrenaline spiked again. In my time off, I would gotten very familiar with firearms and I now carried one quietly on my person. I clocked out and decided to head toward the direction of the screaming. I thought about calling the police but I wanted to see what was going on before involving them. This was a mistake, I know. As I got closer to the screams, I saw a broken cell phone. I immediately drew my weapon and cautiously walked forward. I arrived in a clearing to find a young woman, her legs separated from her body, white as a ghost and trying to speak. I looked around as I approached her, 
and that's when I was hit by something that felt like a truck and was suddenly on my back. My gun had slid away, and looking me in the eyes was that damned wolf that had mauled Harold to death. I remember my knife and ripped it from the holster before stabbing this beast in the left eye. I did it almost like an instantaneous reaction to my situation. I didn't think about it. I instinctively attacked. I don't know if I was pissed about Harold or the other rangers, or I was more concerned with my own survival. But, whatever the case, this creature yelped and leaped back for a moment. I took my opportunity and scrambled to my gun before standing up and staring this creature in its cold, black, lifeless eyes. I remember it taking its paws and using them to remove the knife from its own eye before growling a hatred I had never encountered before. The thing howled and ran for me, at which point I emptied the bullets in my magnum into this thing. The creature stopped in his tracks and fell back a bit, staggered. I reloaded my weapon. The creature began coming toward me slowly this time, bleeding from the bullet wounds and its eye. It fell over, coughing up blood and glared before howling one last time and rushing into the woods. I remember seeing this girl's fail pace look as she clung to life. I did all I could to help slow the bleeding while I dialed 911. It took no time at all to arrive, at which point the young woman was carried off and I was questioned. Ultimately, I took over duties as the head of the rangers at our park. The woman who I had found with her legs ripped off survived. The most unnerving and unexplainable part of this entire series of encounters was that of my boss. The day she went running errands, also the same day I fought the beast, she went missing. She never returned and was never found. What was found, though, was her husband. She and her husband had issues from time to time, and there were rumors that they were going to be divorcing in the future. She'd even talked to me about it briefly one night while we worked the night shift. That's what is so strange and unexplainable about her disappearance, though. Her husband, well, he was found ripped to pieces in their bed a week or so after the events of that day. He had died the same day I'd been attacked. I don't know how to explain it, but... I believe whatever that beast was, well, I think it was my boss. My name is Daniel, and I was with the park rangers in Texas for roughly 13 years. I've seen all manners of crazy things in my time. I've seen murders weird unexplained phenomena, possible UFO sightings, and even had a run-in or two with the odd crazed homeless person. Something that isn't often talked about in regards to park ranger work is that, while most days things are perfectly normal, a few, if any, rangers get through a career without witnessing or experiencing some sort of strange happening in their time. It feels like the longer I've been a ranger, the more strange stuff I've seen. Well, probably four years ago, I want to say, we started having some really odd occurrences around many of our parks. The first time I encountered something like this, it was April of 2015. I was supervising and filling reports out at the main station of the park. Suddenly, as I was doing this, I heard my radio go off. I responded and asked what was wrong when one of the guys informed me that they kept hearing crying in the woods. I was a bit busy so I gruffly told them, so go investigate it then, and report back when you find out what is going on. That's when they explained to me, they had been investigating, but they hadn't found anyone and every time they were sure they had found the source of the crying, it sounded like it would get farther away all of a sudden. I told them to search the area again, as we weren't in a huge park, and then if they found nothing, call me and I'd go look myself while they clocked out and headed home. About a half hour later, they radioed back and they had found no one, but the crying had stopped. I told them, thank you, come back to the station and clock out and I'd check again to be safe. They arrived and we talked briefly before the ranger left. I finished my paperwork a little late, clocked out, and took my flashlight and headed over towards the woods. It was while I was out there and scanning the place twice over, I heard nothing and found nothing weird or suspicious. Because of this, I went ahead and just went back to the station. It should be noted, I was the only one left at the park of staff at this time. I reached the station and got in my truck. 
I was beginning to pull away when my radio was taken by static, and there was crying over it. I stopped the truck and listened closely. It sounded like it could have been a child crying, and it wasn't long before the station returned to normal and I decided to shake off the odd happening and head home. Saturday morning, I was awoken to a phone call from the local sheriff. They said there was a body hanging in the woods. It was a little girl, and it appeared she had hung herself. I thanked the sheriff for the info and came up to the station. One of the weakened staffers had found the body while doing their morning rounds and was justifiably shocked by the entire situation. I'll admit I was taken a bit aback and considering what I'd hear the night previously, but I was absolutely certain there was no sound when I left the park that night. A few months went by and I was working at a much larger park at this point when I got a call from one of the rangers that took me by surprise. It was another call about crying in the woods. I asked them where they were hearing it, and their response made me a little uneasy. They said they were hearing it from everywhere. I asked the ranger to elaborate and they explained something eerily similar to the previous report at the park a few months back. They said they'd followed the sound of crying and every time they thought they'd found the source, the crying would sound as though it was from way farther away. I told them to wait for me as I headed up that way. I arrived to something truly strange. The crying was indeed still happening, and try as we might, we could not find the source anywhere. I told the ranger to head home, and I called the sheriff's office and asked if they could spare someone to keep watch over the area overnight. After a lot of discussions, they said they'd see if they could get someone off duty to watch the place overnight. I informed them of my concerns, and they agreed it was worth watching over the place, just in case. I went home that night and crashed rather quickly comfortable in the idea that someone was watching the park. It was about midnight when I awoke to a phone call from the sheriff's office. They explained how one of their off-duty deputies began to hear the crying I mentioned. They said they followed the source until eventually they found a body, hanging from a tree. I headed up to the park and talked to the off-duty deputy. They seemed shocked. It wasn't just the body of a teenage girl that left them in shock. It was the fact that upon finding the body, of which there had been no trace of during their previous patrols, they were still hearing the crying. They said the crying only stopped when the sheriff arrived. I thought this was odd, and I was beginning to feel unnerved about it all. Two separate parks, two separate incidents, two different suicides. It was more than a little odd. It was about to get odder, though. A month later, I was assigned to work in my hometown again. I was more than a little relieved by this and I was pretty excited to finally be back home. I had been home for about a month when I began hearing the all too familiar sound. It was the crying. The thing was, it wasn't at the park this time. No. It was in the woods on my property. Need to understand right off the bat I live alone and in the middle of nowhere. I shouldn't be hearing crying of any kind. I took my flashlight and shotgun and headed out of my home. I checked my watch and it was about 10.30 at night. I canvassed my property the entire night. As the sun was coming up, the crying had stopped. I took that opportunity to go back to bed as it was Sunday and I didn't have to work. I awoke at about 5 in the evening to the sound of distant crying once again. I called up the sheriff's office and told them I'd wait up for them before searching the property. The sheriff arrived at 6 and we began canvassing my property together. By 9 p.m. we were about to call the search off when we heard the unnerving laughter. The sheriff and I walked in the direction of the sound and upon cresting the hill, we found the single most disturbing sight that I have ever seen in my entire lifetime. It was a circle with a pentagram inside of it. The thing was though, the circle and pentagram were made of the naked bodies of women. The most disturbing part is that they all had smiles on their faces. I didn't sleep very well the rest of that night, and after the investigation was complete, it appeared the woman had committed suicide. It seemed they had poisoned themselves before holding hands and forming the symbol in the spot of their death. I can tell you right now, I've never felt so unnerved in my life. It wasn't just the strange nature of the deaths, but the fact these suicides kept following me. I wasn't sure where this would end or how, but... I was beginning to feel very unsafe. 
This was further reinforced by the fact that this one had happened on my own property. The next couple of weeks I didn't get much sleep. I kept having horrific nightmares of the dead bodies on my property. I couldn't get it out of my head. Sometimes I'd awake in a panic thinking I heard crying again, but ultimately it turned out it was all of my dreams. I remember pondering what the hell was happening and why it had happened. It wasn't much longer before I was assigned to go out of town again. I took this opportunity happily. I'd barely gotten any rest and I wasn't feeling the safest at home anymore. This was strengthened my final night at home when I woke up to the sound of three loud knocks at my door at 2am. I checked the door with my gun of course, but all I found was a picture in red ink of the pentagram with the bodies. I burned the thing and went to bed. Now that I was out of town I hoped things would settle for a bit. Sadly, they didn't. My first day of work we began hearing cries in the wood. We had local law enforcement monitoring the park that night, with who they could spare and myself as well. The cries began around sunset. It was almost as though they had been planned. We searched the place high and low and found nothing. I remained there the whole night, eventually sleeping in the station. I was awoken that morning to screaming. I scrambled to my feet and opened the door to find one of the rangers staring in shock. I nearly slipped and after regaining my balance I looked down to see blood. Pinned to the door was a woman's decapitated head. She still wore a smile. Law enforcement was called immediately and I was grilled about it if I was connected to all of this. I vehemently denied any involvement and found myself disturbed by what had happened. On the door, it read, a message. I give myself to you. The victim had been identified, but whoever had decapitated her hadn't. The handwriting of the note was that of the victims. None of this made any sense, and I was more than freaked out at this point. I took some time off of work, and while I wasn't allowed to leave the state as I was technically considered a person of interest, I was allowed to go home. Every night I was awoken to three knocks at random points each night. I was usually left a gift of some kind by who I didn't know. Sometimes it was dead animals, other time it was weird poetry and more times than not odd symbols. I had local law enforcement around my place 24-7 and no one ever saw who left these gifts. Eventually, these strange noises stopped. I was having trouble sleeping and I was spooked enough that I went ahead and resigned from my position. I'm not sure what was up with the suicides or the strange sacrifices. I still do not know to this day. That said, some nights, even now, I'm awoken to knocks. The only difference being, no one is there and now nothing is left behind. I could still hear the crying though. Every time. I'm a 30 year old female park ranger who works out of New Jersey. My story takes place in 2012 and involves a strange occurrence around my park. Before we get started, no, it wasn't the Jersey Devil. I won't list where I work as I still work there and I don't wish to have my colleagues think ill of me. Anyway, it was around the holidays and we were having a nighttime event to celebrate. A few rangers, myself included, volunteered to watch over the event for some extra pay despite the fact we were normally on vacation. All we were to do during this event was watch over it, patrol the woods to make sure there was nothing weird going on, and help clean up at the end to make sure the park was in order. Being I didn't really want to be around the party itself, I volunteered to patrol the woods. I've always been a bit of a recluse and I've always found the woods relaxing, day or night. On this night, however, that would change. It was about 9pm and there were fireworks being set off. We'd gotten approval to do this prior, and from the cheering in the distance, it seemed everyone was having a great time. Shortly after the fireworks rang out, I heard an inhuman scream. It was almost like a screech more than a scream, and the initial sound of it made me jump. I quickly looked toward the sky, as that's where I heard the noise. It was then I noticed something in the trees. It looked like a shadow. It had clear, red eyes. 
there were no wings that I could see, and this figure seemed to curl on a branch and leer at me. I slowly moved from my radio, but this figure seemed to emit a high-pitched signal that made me drop my radio and grip my ears. When the noise stopped, I realized my radio was no longer functioning, and I looked up to see the odd shadow had vanished. I'm not one to give up easily, and I also have a really morbid curiosity. This is probably to my detriment, and I'm quite sure it'll get me killed someday. That said, being the morbidly curious soul I am, I went searching for this odd shadow creature. I searched for roughly two hours. When I heard fireworks and the same screeching again, whatever this thing was didn't like the sound of fireworks, and as I closed in on the sound, I noticed the shadowy figure once again lurking in the trees. I walked slowly toward it, at which point it seemed to turn its head backward like an owl and stared at me. That was pretty off-putting, but what was more unnerving was the meat. Now, inside the mouth of this thing, it was now that I could easily see the large, extremely sharp teeth that seemed to gleam in the moonlight, the blood from its prey freshly dripping from the thing's shadowy lips. It was at that moment I decided it was far better to back away slowly and leave the woods. As soon as I turned around, I heard movement and a high-pitched screeching erupted in the air again. I remember a ringing, piercing my ears as I fell to my knees, cupping my ears with my hands once again. When the screeching stopped, I was having trouble hearing and could see blood coming from my ears. I remember being frozen in fear and thinking to myself that I was an idiot. I thought I was about to die here, a victim to something that no one knew existed. I waited, a bit dizzy and unable to really move as I felt a cold breathing go right across my neck. I closed my eyes and shook in terror as I felt the thing slowly study me. I soon broke down crying, assuring this thing I meant no harm and begging it not to kill me. I had a thought cross my mind about how silly I was, as I was appealing to something that was clearly a carnivorous predator of some sort. I heard a strange cooing. That's the best way I can describe it and soon after I felt a strong wind, then all was silent. There wasn't the sound of animals or anything. Granted, things were sort of muted as my ears were still ringing at the time. It was another half an hour before my ears began to dull and I was no longer afraid to move. I slowly got to my feet and scanned the area. There was nothing there. Deciding to no longer seek this creature out or test my luck again, I went ahead and began heading back. As I walked, I remember feeling something watching me. In fact, I'm quite sure this thing was stalking me now as I slowly walked out. I was too afraid to look behind me, instead opted to continue walking and promising myself as I was not going to stop for any reason. Eventually, I did reach the tree line and head out of the woods. My colleagues asked where I was and I explained my radio died and may have malfunctioned, not saying why it was. Before joining them for the cleanup, the rest of the night went fine and I eventually went to the hospital to get checked out. They said I had permanent hearing loss, but there didn't seem to be any other negative effects. They did several scans and nothing of note was found. I never explained what had happened or why I lost part of my hearing, but to this day, I'll never forget what happened out there in the woods. Now, even when working, I'm a bit skittish, even, even when I'm not in the woods. This is usually more in the winter when it gets darker, earlier. I've never seen this mysterious and shadowy creature since, and I've found no research that would allude to what it could have been. I'm positive it isn't the Jersey Devil though. That said, whatever it is, it's still out there. So, if you're ever out in the woods of New Jersey at night, no, there is more to be wary of than just the Jersey Devil. My story takes place in my first year as a park ranger. The staff around the park had shared with me stories of weird goings on around the park when I was first hired. It was enough of a topic of talk that it was actually brought up right after I had been told I was going to be hired. I work in North Dakota and I'd say my five years as a ranger have actually been relatively tame. The exception being while hanging around the station. Nothing violent has ever come of these happenings, but I have been more than a little unnerved in my time while working here. 
What is it that is so unnerving to me, you ask? Well, things have a tendency to move on their own. I'm not just talking someone messing with us. I'm talking full on camera footage of things moving. The first time I experienced this was in my first year. It was caught on camera, but I was also there. I was making some coffee and went to grab some sugar packets when I was reaching out for the packets. The container carrying them slid further to my left. I looked around to make sure no one was around when I remember checking the cameras after. It definitely happened. Still, this wasn't as strange as something that happened while patrolling the park one evening before closing. I was out on my own and picking up trash and checking on the status of things before I left for the weekend. My supervisor was at the station waiting for me to wrap things up. While patrolling and getting ready to head back to the station, my radio went off. It was my supervisor telling me to come back to the station now. I quickly ran back without even responding. When I got back, my supervisor asked why I was back so quickly. I explained he had just yelled for me to rush back over the radio, at which point he looked at me like I was stupid. I sat in silence for a moment before explaining my situation again. He shook his head and swore to me that he didn't call for me at all. I shrugged it off and just told him I didn't see anything off and everything seemed fine otherwise, and then I headed home. Somewhat embarrassed but also suspicious of my boss. Monday rolled around and we all arrived to a not so fun surprise. The main station had been vandalized. The thing is though, when we checked the footage, Things were flying around, but there was seemingly no one throwing them. Odd as it was, we all just decided to start the morning cleaning up and then hit our morning patrol right after. At this point, I'd begun to grow accustomed to the strange happenings around the park and station. So, when an odd thing would move or a strange sound would occur, I'd basically grown to ignore it. The main point of my story, however, the thing is, I will explain now, was not something I could simply ignore away. I was driving in a cart along the hiking trail when I suddenly saw a disheveled woman coming out of the tree line. She was bleeding profusely. I immediately stopped the cart and came to her aid. The woman began vomiting blood inside my arms and I was about to radio the main station when just as quickly as I blinked there was no woman and there was no blood. I stood there in shock for a moment before regaining my senses, searching the area thoroughly. I found no trail of blood, no woman, nothing. Even as I speak about this now, I'm in shock. I was late for my morning patrol, my supervisor wanted to know what was up. I didn't know what to say, but because he could clearly see shock on my face, he persisted with questioning me. I eventually broke down and explained everything I had seen. That was when he got some water and told me to come to his office. My supervisor explained how he realized I was newer to the area and that while I saw seemed very real and understood my shock, he assured me it was okay. I looked at my boss dumbfounded at how he could think it was okay. He could clearly see my thoughts all over my face and he immediately explained some of the history behind the park and area. He said it was likely the ghost of a woman murdered in the park several years prior. I asked how he was so nonchalant about the situation, but he explained everyone at the park has seen the woman's ghost at one point or another and had the same reaction. He described the woman to me and I confirmed that was who I saw to the tiniest detail. I didn't find this situation funny, but my boss had a smile and told me congrats, you are now officially one of the team. Looking back and having gotten to know the man better, I realized my boss wasn't making light of the murder, but more of the reaction of me seeing this ghost. He and all the staff had experienced this woman in the same area at different periods through their time at the park. I'm now a lot more relaxed about the whole thing and I guess I shouldn't be shocked I guess considering the other weird things that had happened here previously. Still, if you'd have been there, if you'd have seen how real it was, I imagined you'd have a similar reaction. I still work at the park now, and strange things still happen, but I've never encountered anything as strange as that since. Anyway, thank you for sharing my story, and I apologize if it was a bit brief. I'm not even sure how to begin this story. I have been and still am working for the park rangers in Washington. I love my job and despite the events of the story, I still love my job to this day. I've been doing this for about 25 years and am getting 
to retire at the end of this year, actually. What I'm about to explain will make a little sense, but I'll do my best to explain it anyway. The first thing you need to understand is that the origins of these incidents are still up for debate as these have not been solved nor were any of them covered by the news or given to public knowledge. I've always been a believer in odd things. I've been this way since I was a kid. I used to see ghosts. I stopped talking about such things when I realized people thought I was strange. I know it's going to seem silly after hearing this, but I assure you I am a sound mind and very logical in my thoughts overall. I'm not crazy and this story has nothing to do with ghosts. This story has to do with disappearances of missing people. This story has to do with disappearances and missing persons. Ten years into my job was when the first disappearance happened. We have a lot of woods up here in Washington. It also rains a fair amount around here. While working a seemingly normal day, one evening it began to rain. The rain was heavy and there was a thick fog because of the conditions. That said, I thought nothing of it. A few days later we had someone come into the main station and report a missing family member. They mentioned they had been missing for a few days at this point and the last place they were known was to be hiking in our park. I took down their information and the information of the missing family member and assured them we do all we could do to aid law enforcement in their search for the missing family member. We spent the next few days searching high and low for the missing family member. Eventually, we found something. What we found was more than a little odd, though. It was shoes. The shoes were taken in for DNA testing and were found to match that of the missing family member. Law enforcement informed the family members of the missing person about our findings, and we also assured them we'd keep searching. Sadly, we never found further evidence of this missing soul. There are few feelings as horrible as a family member who keeps coming in or calling for information on their missing loved one only for you to have to tell them, sorry, you have no further information on their whereabouts. It cuts you as deep as something possibly can emotionally, and I don't look forward to doing this. A year went by and we never found the missing person. Things would get stranger in October when another seemingly normal day would be plagued by sudden rain. We get rain and often it is easy to forecast, but this rain seemed sudden and I'm positive there was no forecast of rain. Still, a forecast is just that, a forecast. It's not 100% accurate and Mother Nature will do whatever she wishes to do ultimately. Looking back, I get a sense of deja vu about this day. I didn't pick up on it at the time, but the conditions were the same as the day of the first missing person. A sudden rain, a heavy fog, and then a few days later, a man came in reporting his daughter missing. The only real difference is this time it was a man reporting a daughter missing whereas the previous was a woman's brother. Still, a missing person is sad all the same. When the second missing person was reported, we followed procedure and started to search immediately. Before the day was over, we had found something that did strike us all all the time. We found a pair of shoes once again. There was no gear, no clothing, just the shoes. There were no signs of any further movement and no sort of forensic evidence that might lead to where this woman had gone. Much like the missing man, she had seemingly come to a random spot in the woods and simply vanished, leaving only her shoes behind. We searched high and low and never found any sort of evidence as to where the latest missing person or the previous one had gone. A few months went by and this time I was fully aware how strange the circumstances were. It was a Friday morning and there were 0% chance of rain. I'm absolutely certain of this. Still, about 3 in the afternoon, a heavy rain set in out of nowhere and a heavy fog accompanying it. The sense of deja vu hit me immediately this time as opposed to in hindsight. It hit me so strongly in fact that I decided to go out and canvas the area on my own. Immediately. I spent the better part of the afternoon and evening in search. When the rain finally let up, I found a couple of pairs of shoes, called the police that second. They came and took the evidence. I was asked about why I'd begun a search without a missing person investigation opened, and I explained that after the previous two times, that I had an off feeling and wanted to search the grounds. This naturally made me a person of interest, but I was quickly cleared and able to return to work within a few days. The people that went missing were a young couple in their 20s, who were actually vacationing and on their honeymoon. We searched high and low for them as well, and the others, but we only found the same things, 
their shoes. There were always shoes left behind, nothing else. It was though they would vanish into thin air. I feel an endless amount of guilt for the missing, and the circumstances are just odd. Five years later, it happened once more. We had been in a week of sunshine, and it was a Sunday that seemed as though it would be no different. There was no rain forecast at all for the next ten days at the least. I was actually off when this one happened. Heavy rain set in out of the blue, and even heavier fog set in with it. I remember shaking out of worry about the circumstances and the sense of deja vu I got was jarring. I called the police and they explained that they had already had a few units at the park, searching the area. It was about six that evening when I got a call saying a family of six had gone missing. Their shoes were all that remained. I wasn't sure what to say or how to react anymore. I couldn't begin to explain what was happening to the missing. I still work as a park ranger and we've never had another missing case like these ones around the park since. No similar weather pattern that wasn't forecasted, none of that. I'm retiring at the end of the year, however. My disdain for being unable to solve these disappearances or get these families of the missing closure will haunt me for the remainder of my days. Being a park ranger is a passion of mine. I love the idea of being with nature as much as I enjoy the idea of helping others connect with such things. I've been doing this job for about 14 years and I am from Texas. I work around the state and I work in many parks. I've been blessed to be able to do what I love since finishing college. In all my years of doing this job I've seen a lot of things. Some strange, some scary, and many quite the opposite. Many I'd say were quite beautiful. I've always been a believer in the strange and paranormal. I've never been much of a skeptic, and it's hard to be if you've grown up the way I have. When, when I was little, my mother would often say that she'd find me talking to my grandmother. My grandmother died three years before I was born. That is more for background and not something I'll get into. Instead, I'd like to talk about October of 2007. I was working in Central Texas and around this time we started having some odd happenings around the park. The first really odd encounter was one of our dogs we had, basically a mascot of sorts, started rushing off and would always wind up in the same area, in an open patch of forest. Once there, it would begin barking for about 5 minutes before it stopped and act normal again. This continued on for a week. It was a Wednesday morning when Sally, our dog, ran to the same spot in the woods. I remember it vividly, as upon arrival, there were several other unfamiliar dogs in the area, and they all barked in unison toward the sky. This was strange, but five minutes later they stopped. About mid-October, this behavior stops abruptly. There are no strange gatherings of the animal kingdom or anything that seemed out of the ordinary. That was until about the end of my shift when I thought I saw someone out of the corner of my eye. I looked closely around the area but, quite simply, could not find anyone. So I headed to the station to clock out. I was the last one out on this day as my boss at the time was on the vacation. Looking back, I wish I would have been on that as well. What happened next was unnerving to put it lightly. One of my coworkers came to me the next morning upon my arrival into work and complained of a woman who didn't stop staring at her. My, my first thought was maybe it was a homeless lady, but when I asked for a description of the woman, she sounded straight out of another timeline. She wore a black bonnet, an all-black dress. She looked dressed for church and seemed to carry a Bible. That was strange, but I thought maybe it was a Bible thumper. They exist everywhere, and some of them can be quite judgmental. My coworker seemed genuinely scared, which was strange as she wasn't easily startled. I told her I'd go with her and we would check on the area where this woman stood. Well, we head up and to my shock, we find ourselves in the same spot the dogs used to be. In the center of this tree line, there stood a woman, clear as day, matching the description given to me by the coworker. I approached the woman and asked her why she was staring down my coworkers. The woman didn't say a word and that's when I noticed her eyes. The eyes of this woman were pure black. It was the darkest black I've ever seen, and as I looked into them I felt the need to cry. 
I am not sure why or how to explain it, but before I knew it, I was crying and overcome with emotion. I wasn't just crying like a normal cry, I was crying and my legs were like jelly. I was hysterical. I soon fell to my knees and began crying more. I'm not sure how to help you realize how strange this whole situation was. The more I cried, the more the woman stared. At first, her face was stone cold, but after a time, and as I cried more, I saw a smirk grow in her face. All sorts of confused, I tried to stop, but I couldn't. It wasn't long before I noticed some of the dogs we'd previously seen suddenly form up around us. The dogs were growling. I was crying and my coworker was screaming bloody murder. It was a strange feeling and I'm not sure how to justifiably elicit to you the things going through my mind. I couldn't control my actions. I couldn't think straight. There was just an unending sadness. And then, before I knew it, the dogs were barking and growling at us. At least, I think they were. It was at this point I felt so out of it and things were so dizzy, I began to notice I no longer perceived anything if I was awake or dreaming any longer. At the height of my sorrows, everything went blurry. And the next thing I knew, a jogger was waking me up. I awoke with a startle and asked for my coworker, who was still asleep and freaking out. I did my best to wake her up, and after a while, I took her back to the station, after thanking the jogger who seemed to want an explanation, but I was so confused and also worried that I didn't give one, but left after saying thanks. I remember my coworker was quite hot. I felt her forehead, and she was burning up. I called an ambulance and they took her to the hospital, at which point she was kept there for the next few nights. My coworker was eventually released, but she quit immediately. I tried to get her to stay and even tried to get her to come back, but she just wouldn't. She didn't answer any of my calls after that, and last I heard she moved out of state. I don't know how to explain this woman or the things that happened to my coworker and I. I will say there have been quite a few times people have been up in the area and have been found out cold or babbling to themselves. I feel that area is cursed in some way, as that's the only explanation I can truly come up with. I know that barely makes much sense, but then again, what really does anymore? Was this woman a ghost? Some sort of demon? Is there some sort of plausible and sensible explanation for it? I'm not sure of anything anymore. I'm, I'm not sure of how to explain the odd behavior of the dogs either. I still work with park services today, but I refuse to work at that park any longer. From what I understand, no one has turned up dead in that area, but, in my honest opinion, something is wrong with that place. Hello. You can call me E. I've worked with the park rangers for about 10 years, before moving out of state and into a different profession. I don't know that my story is necessarily scary, but it is strange. I won't specify where I was working at the time, other than to say that I worked in the Midwest when this all happened. I will say I really enjoyed my years as a park ranger. They were wonderful, and in this case, a bit strange. The oddity began when I was doing my morning patrol and found what looked to be a painted angel on a tree. Now, it was oddly well detailed. If this had been painted on a canvas, not on one of our beautiful trees, I wouldn't have minded. But because it was one of our trees, though, I had to take some photos and write up a report to give to my supervisor. I scoured the area and found no sign of paint or anything. Figuring it was either an artist or some sort of vandalism, I filed my report and went about my day. Five hours go by when we're approached at the station by someone freaking out. They explained that they found a jogger lying dead next to a tree with an angel. I wasn't freaked out by this, but I did find it strange. I followed the woman to find it was the very same tree. We had the paramedics arrive soon after, and it was later on that I discovered the elderly man had died of a heart attack. Alright, that's weird, but I believe in coincidence. 
and so I just figured it was one of those odd but unfortunate things that sometimes happens in life. A couple of months go by, and I've forgotten all about the older man and the painted angel. Once again, while wandering our parks, I noticed yet another painted angel. This one was not on a tree, though. It was on a bench. It wasn't large or anything, unlike the first one. This was a smaller angel. I was a little thrown, but my mind being the way it is, decided it was probably some person who was inspired in some weird way by the art and saw the story in the paper. The next day, a young woman was found lying at the bench. We thought she might have been sleeping, but upon attempting to wake her up, she was found to be dead. The reason for this was quite explainable, though. She was shooting up heroin and had come here overnight to do so. The final cause of this woman's passing was an overdose, but they didn't think it was a suicide. I mention this because she was sitting on the angel painted on the bench at the time of her death. The thought was initially the woman painted it, then committed some weird ritualistic suicide of some kind. This was ruled out when the cause of death was reported later on. Police and, well, to be honest, we rangers were completely perplexed as to how this was happening or why. Who was painting these angels? And why at every place one was painted would someone die? It created a bit of conversation, but as a year passed without any other deaths or incidents, people kind of just let it go, myself included. It was around Christmas of the following year that the strangest one happened. This one didn't actually happen in the park I worked at at the time, but at a church in the town that I worked in. Another angel had appeared. It was painted in red as always on the back of the church itself. Knowing how the previous incidents occurred, people grew naturally curious. The angel that was painted was much larger than the others, and above the head and wings were the words, May they know peace. This was the first time a message had appeared with an angel, and every attempt to and every attempt to remove the angel was futile. No matter what was used, it remained there. Having given up with nothing happening over a couple of weeks, people pretty much thought this one was a prank and the others were a coincidence. That was until one Sunday, when the church was having a service and a big lunch that afternoon. During the prayer and worship service, some of the members were prepping the food and the stoves. The stoves were gas and upon ignition, a leak would cause an explosion that killed everyone inside instantly and burned the church to the ground. After this, we never saw another painted angel or any other kind of strange symbols around town. This was the final one, and all three had predicted death or deaths of some kind. I'm not sure how to explain that rationally, but it was such a strange sequence of events that I felt the need to share it. Who was painting the angels? Did they know these souls would die? Was it a warning? Or... Was it simply a strange pre-memorial? Well, I'm sure we'll never know. In New Jersey, most people will talk of the Jersey Devil, especially when working in the park's department. As a park ranger, though, there are other things I've seen in my brief five years that I think are far stranger. Everything from your typical ghost sightings in the area to tales of strange people who watch from the tree line or the edges of the woods. All that aside, what I want to talk about is my encounter with what I believe to be a hellhound or some sort of spiritual animal. My story takes place in October of 2016. We were prepping for a Halloween event and some tours we like to do from time to time in the area. 
These tours include walks through the trails that we decorate to be spooky for kids and young teenager, talks of local hauntings and all around general spooky fun. Things these tours aren't supposed to include would be sightings of actual ghosts or me running for my life. I'll get to that though. The early part of this incident mostly includes seeing a dog in the distance. I always saw it at night and during the tours it seemed to follow and watch. I'm not sure the breed, but it was all black and huge. I've never seen one so big. It was my first time seeing this dog. I tried to get its attention and it just stared at me. If I tried to approach it, the thing would simply turn and run away. It didn't seem to be threatening, so I eventually just let it be. I'd occasionally check to see if it would follow. And I'd see it, and I'd think nothing of it. About mid-October, I remember noticing on the tour that night, I didn't see the dog that usually follows. We were about midway through the tour when a woman began screaming. Those on the tour were naturally startled as the scream was loud and it sounded like someone was in unbelievable peril. I took one of my coworkers, who we'll call Randy, and we rushed to go after the source of the screaming. It wasn't long before we found a person laying in the ground in pain. We pulled up to a woman bleeding and screaming hysterically about her husband being drug off by a massive black dog and that it had mauled her but grabbed him. Once we got her to slow down, we were able to make her make sense. It seemed this dog came from nowhere and vanished just as quickly. The woman described something completely unbelievable. She said she saw this thing dragging her husband into the woods and both it and her husband vanished into thin air. I was quite skeptical about this and figured her mind was playing tricks on her and maybe the amount of stress was causing her to hallucinate. I fully believed the dog existed as I was pretty sure it was the one I had been seeing, but I thought maybe her panic had maybe caused some hysteria and began to remember things or seeing things that might have not happened. I'm not a psych, but that was my initial theory for what happened. At least, this is what I believed until Halloween night, when we had our biggest celebration. I saw that dog again during the tour. It was the first time I had seen it since the woman reported being mauled by it. The thing looked larger than last time, and I felt much more afraid than I had previously. The entire aura around the thing had changed. The best way I can say this is to say that the first time I saw it, it seemed harmless. But on this night, it, it felt off. It felt like this thing was staring into my soul. I continued the tour, constantly checking behind me, as I did and eventually, I noticed the dog didn't appear to be around anymore. The rest of the celebration went well, and once all the festivities were over, and most of the cleanup was done, I told my boss I'd stay behind and lock up and clean up what was left. They asked if I was sure, to which I reassured them that I was, and I wasn't tired anyway, so I'd be passing up the time. Everyone went home at this point, and I was the only person left in the park. I spent about an hour cleaning up and was just finishing throwing out the trash and locking up the station when I went toward my vehicle. It was there, in front of my truck, I saw this thing. It was no longer in the distance, it was straight in front of me and I'm positive it wasn't there a moment before. It was strange how quickly this dog appeared and even stranger how scarily huge it was up close. I remember feeling a choking feeling as the dog stared at me. I felt like the life was draining from my body. I remember turning and trying to head back to the station, but as I did, I heard a large bark. The bark didn't sound normal at first. It was quite deep and not entirely like a dog bark. I fell to the ground out of fear and loss of feeling in my legs at first. I remember thinking I need to get up or I'm going to die. Scrambling to my feet, I bolted for the station, unlocked it and slammed it shut locking it behind me. I remember the door shaking as this dog slammed against it. I looked around the office and eventually found a flare gun. I grabbed it and aimed it at the door, waiting any second for this thing to just blow through. Not even a moment later, the door began caving in off its hinges and this huge black dog stared at me, growling and walking closer. 
I panic and fire a flare off that hits this dog and sets it ablaze. I then run for a back entrance and bust out the door, running with all my might for my truck. I'm screaming as I reach my truck and jump in. I lock it, turn the key, and fire up my truck in the time to see this dog on fire rushing for my truck. I hit the gas and run into the dog which damages the front of my truck. Thankfully, I believe I'm safe once my truck bounces from over the body of this huge thing lying on the ground. It is only a few seconds later before it begins to spaz and soon stand up on all fours. I can hear its bones snapping as it heads back in my direction. I am freaked out and run deeper into the woods. I begin screaming my lungs out for help as I run. I can feel that draining feeling growing within me. My thoughts are clouded and my vision begins to blur as I run and force myself to call out. It isn't long before I'm unsure if sound is coming out as I scream and hear nothing. I'm exhausted, but hightailing it deeper anyway. The only thing crossing my mind at this point is that this thing is chasing me, and if it catches me, I'm dead. There will be no ifs, ands, or chances. I just pray, scream, even though I cannot hear a sound and I keep running. I figure I'll keep going till I collapse or am dragged to God only knows where by that thing. I'm quite sure I'm going to die when I see lights ahead. I think faintly, I hear someone asking if everything is alright. I'm waving my arms when I hear a gun go off and feel a bullet go by me. I hear a yelp as I fall to the ground. There's a sheriff, and I'm too exhausted to speak out. I remember feeling sick and throwing up. There was a low growling and then a loud bark before everything went silent again. When things went silent, I felt my vision and hearing return to me. The sheriff took me to a hospital and I checked out shortly after perfectly fine other than some scrapes from my falls. I don't know what that thing truly was. I suggested a hellhound, but I'm not sure, to be honest. I've refused to work the Halloween event since, and to my knowledge, there haven't been any more sightings or deaths from that dog. At any rate, that's my story, and I was wondering if anyone had a clue of what this thing could have been. I'm grateful to have not seen it since, but it also opened my mind to a realization and possibility that things out there exist and we can't simply explain it. I am grateful to be alive today, and I pray to never see that thing again. I've only been with the park rangers in Northern California for just about three years now. During that time though, I have had the most amazing thing happen to me. When I joined the rangers, I was somewhat ill, but I wasn't quite aware of this fact yet. I was also in desperate need of a job and beyond grateful to the park rangers in my town for taking a chance on me. I showed my gratefulness by being as upbeat and enthusiastic as I can about my work. I was a heavy smoker for many years prior to this, and it gave me a bad cough, which I didn't really think much of as I had had this for years. Now, before the events that follow, I was always a very skeptical soul. I'd argue I still am to a degree. All that said, I have no earthly explanation for what happened to me. To start out, about six months into my time with the park rangers, I began to notice that my cough was taking a mean turn and on top of that, there was blood in my phlegm. This startled me the first time I noticed it happening, but, being I needed the job, and I didn't want to let my coworkers down, I also love the job, I tried to brush it off as not being a big deal. Maybe being an allergy thing. So, I continued working until a Friday evening about three days later, when I was cleaning up before heading home, and while taking the trash out to the dumpster, I had a brutal coughing fit. All I remember from it was coughing, struggling to breathe, being dizzy, and then waking up in a hospital with my boss and one or two others I was working with hanging around the hospital room. I'm a guy in my late 40s, so when this happened, I was closer to my mid-40s. I say this to give you an idea of the fact that my body wasn't exactly in prime shape, especially with the smoking since I was like 12. I spent the next day or two in the hospital, and as time went on, I was eventually given the harsh truth of life. We all die someday, somehow, and somewhere. I was told I had lung cancer, and it had progressed far enough that my odds of life or lengthy life were pretty much non-existent. 
I'll admit, at that moment I was upset. I was very angry and pissed off at myself for my stupid life choices. I was angry at whatever higher power there may be because I felt like they were screwing with me. Here I'd finally found something I absolutely loved doing and had also paid the bills. Here I'd finally found balance in my life after searching for so many years. Yet, after all that, here's some sick joke being played on me. And now that I'd found balance, I was being told that I was not going to be around much longer to enjoy that peace of mind. I became dejected and quite honestly, I just didn't care anymore. I told my work what was going on, and I refused to just sit around and die. I couldn't exactly work in the heat of the day very well, but with supervision, I was allowed to work on a later shift as long as I took it easy. There was another night guy, and night work wasn't really all that hard. We basically patrolled the area, making sure it stayed clear of the homeless from about 5 p.m. to about midnight, and then went home. While on these late-night patrols, one of the places we checked was by the lake in our park. This was a pretty awesome area, and even had a path that led with stones to a small island with a tree. While doing my patrol one night, I was quite sure I had saw a woman loitering by the tree. She felt different. She wasn't threatening. But I couldn't just let her chill by the tree, unfortunately. The park was closed and it was time to go. So, being the cranky, sick guy I was, I hollered over to this woman. What in the nine hells are you doing out here, ma'am? The woman looked up at me and smiled. I remember her vividly as she had a shorter haircut. Not shaved or anything, but like neck length hair. It didn't quite reach her shoulders. I remember a warmth coming over my body as she smiled. She looked like she was wearing a white gown, and she was very much here, or so I thought. She wasn't translucent or anything. She looked as real as your hand would to your face. My point being she seemed like another human, like you or I. I noticed she wasn't really leaving the island, and I reiterated the young lady that it was time to go. About that time I heard Hank, the guy who supervised me, come around the corner and laugh at me, asking me who I was talking to. I felt insulted in a way, and turned back and told him that the woman, what are you, blind? Hank just laughed harder now and asked about what woman. I turned back and was about to point her out when I noticed she was gone. I asked Hank to check behind the tree for me as I didn't have the strength to get across the stone walkway. He did and assured me there was no one around. I looked perplexed and then shook it off before telling him I must need sleep. He told me not to worry about it and we'd better head out. Hank was my ride at the time, as I was told not to drive myself to and from work due to my condition. After dropping me off, he left and I promptly went inside and crashed. As I slept, I found myself back at the lake. The woman I swore I saw earlier was there. I knew I was dreaming and yet at the same time none of it felt like a dream. She held her hand out silently and I remember a hesitation and fear. Despite being sure I was dreaming, I felt so weak and was afraid to try to cross to the island. I'd fall somewhere along the way and drown, I was sure of it. That's when I heard her voice. Come, she said. Join me. Before I could refuse, a warmth came over my body again. I stepped forward, slowly and shakily. I remember every step I took. I grew shorter of breath. Things felt dizzy and hazy and yet, through my blurred vision, she simply stood there, gown blowing in the wind, smiling at me. She seemed so assured and confident in the fact that I would make it, and so I continued onward, and two before I knew it, I made it to the island and fell to my knees begging for air. I felt like I was dying. Some part of me knew I, I had to be dying and waking life. I felt a hand place itself on my shoulder and another underneath me. I felt this honest to God, strange feeling. And then this woman looked at me with a wider smile. It was a comforting smile. I felt in that moment that perhaps she was a personification of death and this was my time. I felt okay with it. I just wanted to let go. She shook her head no, as though she read my mind and lowered herself to my level, before leaning in as though she was going to kiss me. She stopped short and blew a visible air into my open mouth. I felt this air go through my lungs and for a moment I fell to my knees and vomited this black, bile-looking fluid. I continued to vomit 
and as I did, I felt a hand touch the top of my sweaty head. It's going to be okay, she said. At that moment, I vomited up a huge glob of black fluid and felt a seed fall out of it. And I could breathe again. It felt better than I had my entire life. I looked up in confusion to see her smiling, and when I woke up, I shot out of bed, confused and sweaty. I was shaky and checked my temperature. I had a fever of 102, but took something and went to sleep. I woke up 13 hours later shocked to find my temperature was normal. I felt hungry, I could breathe clearly, and I just felt all around better. I rehydrated and called into work and took the night off. The next day, I went in for a checkup, and that moment the doctor looked at me in shock and told me I was cured. I didn't believe it, and asked him to check again and he laughed, assuring me I was going to be fine. He explained the cancer that had stricken my lungs was non-existent now. It seemingly had just, just dis disappeared somehow. He and I both just stood there in stunned shock and he asked me to come back in a couple of weeks to do some double checks. I did this every two weeks for the next three months to be safe and I was fine. I was cancer free and I'm still working today happy and healthy as could be. I still offer to work nights from time to time and I quite often frequent the tree on the island. I haven't seen the woman from there or in my dreams since. I'm aware of how crazy it all sounds, but this experience has led me to believe in a higher power of some kind and in angels. I honestly have no other explanation for my miraculous recovery. I am thankful for every moment I have on this earth, and no longer take a single moment of any day for granted. The scariest thing I've ever experienced in my entire life was while I was working as a park ranger. I only did it for a year. The reason for this was because of the weird stuff going on where I worked in Canada. We have a lot of forest and a lot of mountains. Where I was working you'd often hear loud noises in the distant mountains. I was always told it was a Sasquatch. I thought this was said in jest because I've never really believed that sort of thing and the guys and gals I worked for were known to be jokesters and spin tall tales. One of my supervisors mentioned to me a story about one time when they were working and their truck stalled out in the mountains. They said it was snowing so hard you could barely see in front of you. They then said that they were forced to abandon the truck and head back the way they came on foot. According to my supervisor at the time, he followed the sounds of a Sasquatch until he made his way back, as he couldn't quite tell where he was otherwise due to the blinding snow. Eventually he made it back to the station and was able to get to another truck to pull his truck out later when the snow died down. I was skeptical of this story and I let him know it. He would always chuckle and say that I didn't have to believe in anything for it to be real. Anyway, I wanted to share that to explain to you some of the things that were believed in the area I worked in. At least believed by my coworkers. To get back to the point at hand, I will explain to you about how that the day I thought that I'd be a smartass and show up my coworkers, this was also the last day I worked there, it wasn't that I was fired, it was because I quit after my experiences. I was asked to work on the mountains and help clear the trails of some snow in the area. I agreed and made an off remark about how maybe I'd see a Sasquatch while I was up there. My supervisor got the weirdest grin and simply mumbled to himself, saying, perhaps I would. Five hours into clearing some of the snow with the plow, I heard that sound I typically heard in the distance. Very funny, I thought to myself. That thought didn't last long as I quickly felt something slam hard into my snow plow and flip me off the embankment and down a few feet below. I won't lie, I straight pissed myself at that moment, because it was so sudden and the fall freaked me out as well. I wasn't expecting this and I struggled to get my faculties about me. Mentally, I heard this disturbing sound that I couldn't possibly begin to explain. I'm not sure how to fathom it, but I can say it scared me out of my wits. I began screaming, but the snow had picked up at this point. A very sudden snow, which was not entirely unusual for the mountains, but was not in, it wasn't in the forecast, it just it wasn't expected. It was so random. But I guess that's how blizzards are. They're pretty random. 
It isn't long before I can hear nothing but heavy footsteps plodding through the snow. I try my radio, but it is to no use in the snow. I'm getting no signal and I'm terrified. I quickly hid near my overturned plow, only to hear heavy breathing. Whatever was out there was huge, much bigger than anything I was aware existing in the area. As I stood motionless, I felt something drip on my coat and face. It was saliva, and as I looked up I saw a massive set of teeth. I was at a loss and shaking, not just from the cold but from the terror I felt. I kept thinking, Th this is it, this is where I die. Closing my eyes and praying, I don't even believe in God, but I prayed anyway. I hoped beyond hope for a miracle. Then I heard a loud smashing sound and that inhuman and unexplainable noise roaring from behind with such force it shook the overturned snowplow toward me. My best guess is that it was a yellow pain judging by whatever had hit it. Seeing pieces of ice, I pondered if something hadn't hit this thing with a large block of ice or something. Whatever was in the snow turned its attention away from my direction, and that's when I heard the Sasquatch calls. I didn't believe it was really Sasquatch at first, but as I heard one, there were suddenly others. I wasn't sure what was happening, and I couldn't see very well, but I was quickly grabbed by a large set of hands and placed back up on the embankment where my truck was initially launched. I then followed the calls, and as I did, I could hear fighting in the distance. I didn't wait around and I didn't ask questions, I just continued following the calls until I saw my supervisor close by and shouting for me. I scrambled to him, and I was so cold and terrified out of my mind. I was brought back to the station where I explained everything. He had that same cheeky grin and asked, do you believe us now? I wasn't sure what to believe, but I knew something was out there. I struggled to collect my thoughts and I asked him if he had heard anything else being out there, something massive. He said he hadn't run into anything other than a Sasquatch. He said he'd keep an eye out and asked if I'd be okay as he handed me some cocoa. I shook and told him I was quitting. He seemed taken aback a bit at first, but as he read my face, I think he could see whatever attacked me had bothered me greatly. He didn't fight me and told me to list him as a reference. He said he'd get me somewhere more my style, and he appreciated the work that I'd put in up until that point. I was always a hard worker, but that experience, well, it was the last day I ever wished to be out there. I've never been so terrified in my whole life. If I can tell you for sure two things, I now believe in Sasquatch, and whatever attacked me wasn't a Sasquatch. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange park ranger stories. If you enjoyed them, please hit that like button, as it helps me out a ton. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video. I upload them almost every single day, on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story you would like to share in a future video, whether it be a park ranger story or something else, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. If you're not aware, you can download your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and more. You can find the links to do that in the description down below. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the Swamp. I'll see you guys soon with a fresh batch of new stories.